just making sure that everything's okay. So if I do that. Oh, but one thing that we haven't done this week, Bill, is have you got any news in archaeology and history? It's, it's somebody did ask me, Bill, where have you actually been over the past? Um, where have you actually been over the past right. two, uh, two months? Two months. Yeah, Tell I, me. I, 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 I've been to York, as you know. Yes. Um, and I've got some interesting stories about York, particularly the Roman coins, as you know, Carl. Yeah, but we want to know a little bit more about the Roman coins before we even start. Well, I found the Roman, I went into the Roman bathhouse, that's the pub in the middle of York, yeah? Yeah. And you pay your three pound now and you go down underneath in the cellar region and you see the remains of the military bathhouse. That's the one we've been there, yeah, that's the one. That's right, we've been there and a bit of um, a, a bit of museum there as well. So you asked the guy about the Roman sewers and he told me that his father 40 years ago actually went into the sewers as part of an archaeological excavation to our investigation rather, to, to find them, they did. And he told me where the entrance was in um, in the corner of, uh, I think it's uh, Stonegate, I think. So I just went there and uh, took a photograph of the manhole. Very, very exotic, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I did the usual things, you know, um, Clifford Castle and... Uh, and do you, you know when we went to the first time, we went to the gardens where the um, the remains of one of the um, corner um, multi multi tagonal garden yeah, yeah 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 all the sarcophagi which we saw which are horizontal okay they've now been taken up and actually implanted vertically into a new garden bed so you just see the top of them looking out can you believe what? that yeah yeah I couldn't believe what they've done with it you know. So we can't go there. Now it's a, it's a garden bed now where we went, you know. And I had my photograph taken inside the sarcophagi. It's uh, it's a garden area, fenced off, and and yeah. they, if it, they've been implanted vertically, just the top half showing. Why I don't yeah. know. It's a mistake. I, I'm shaking my head. I don't. I don't get it. Sorry, Bill. I just really. Yeah, uh, that, yeah okay. it's, it's odd. It, it really is odd, Carl. So so I did the um, York Minster as well. And if you go down there now, okay, where, yeah. where the foundations are. Um, it's now a wonderful museum. They've really uh, rejigged it totally, you know. So it's, it's really worth a visit. So they've upgraded to, to, everything. To me and for me, the York Museum was always fantastic. Uh, I, I I went there in the late 1980s. Um, and um, I, I would, I'd, I'd say to Goff, Goff, have you ever been to the Orvik? Um, have you ever? You beat uh, Goff. You've been to York, haven't you? You went recently, didn't you? No, yeah, I was there about six weeks ago. Yeah, I got so totally with Bill. You know, um, and uh, what he's on about in uh, the end of the Minster. Oh, we were there. Oh, we were there at the that. same time, Goff. We must have been well, there at the same time. <laughs> I don't know what you did, Bill, but I, I, we paid a little bit extra. It wasn't very much, but a fiver, and we had a guided tour of about eight of us. No, hmm. I didn't. I didn't do that. No, and that was very enlightening. Um, uh, so we got the bare bones of what we needed to look at, and we were left on them to explore. But underneath the minster, as you say, it's it's just uh, outstanding, isn't it? It's unbelievable. Oh. You need the whole day there, at least. Uh, uh, well, well, well just, I spent you know, three I days. Correct, yeah, i got to correct you there, uh, Goff. You need three days. You do need three days. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and, and the, the one... Just in the minster, you need at least a whole day. Yeah. Yeah. You need a week or so in the in York itself, don't you, if you want to see everything. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. In, um, the archaeological things, I mean, things like things I never thought I would be interested in, like the um, the Railway Museum. <laughs> oh, yes, know, yeah. I took my breath away. It was both of us, you know, we were astounded. You know, it was really, really well worth going, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it, yeah. Mm, but I agree yeah. with you, beneath the Minster now. It's it's outstanding, yeah. Mm. Can you? I, I don't know if you can remember the fire in York, but um, the, the York Minster one up in about nineteen eighty whatever. Um, when when they were refurbishing it, that's when the crypt. And I I, I can remember being one of the. I, I remember being. I was like. I don't know. I must have been about ten. So I went down there with my granddad, and we were some of the first people to go down there. Um, and the one thing that I can say about York, other than what Bill's just said, which is a bit upsetting that they're using sarcophagi as flower beds, um, all I can say about York is that, is that it, it never fails to um, astound me. Um, 
and I've I've led I've led several trips there. I've been there on holiday. I've been I I, th I think I went there on a honeymoon as well. Uh, it's not good that I can't remember to be going there on a honeymoon, but I think I did. But um, and uh, it, it's one thing that I used to say about York is York was like like a really good mistress. It never fails to um, excite and amaze you. And I know that sounds odd, uh, but that's what I feel about York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 also, we oh. also took the afternoon, uh, one afternoon, and we something else I don't really like to do, but I did it because Eleanor wanted to. We went to, to Castle Howard, which is only half an hour away. And yeah. that was, I was so glad I went. It was uh, it was amazing. You know, um, I maybe I'm a bit too set in my old ways. I don't know, but. Uh, yeah, it was it was really good. Yeah. yeah, No, I don't. I don't think you are too set in your own ways. That's that's uh, that's silly because uh, you know this. The, the, the history and archaeology is just basically can excite anybody at any time. And um, do you know? Do you know what, Bill? Right? I know you. I know you. You've had lots of holidays. I think that's that. Um, talk, having a mutual talk about York, um, Bill. You can tell us the rest about your holidays <laughs> next week. Um, <laughs> But 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 yeah no that that's good. One thing I would say, one thing I would say this week, is uh, Bill, uh, with age comes wisdom. And uh, on Tuesday we decided to um, we we now Archaeology Cymru um, has been the tower has sort of formally been transferred to Advahanis Cymru, the new charity. But the tower on the Barry Docks, we we uh, we we put it in a hiab. We've taken it somewhere safe. Um, um and basically the person who cut the legs um did it free of charge um the person who moved it with the hiab um charged us next to nothing we didn't even use scaffolding um and bill i didn't get the i didn't get the media or the press involved or anything because i um we, we had to bring the tower down and the way we did it was not conventional but we did it and we moved it we saved the only bit of D-Day, 6th of June, 2nd World War, architecture left in the whole of Barry, and now we own it. Okay, good for you, well done. So uh, what we are going to be doing, we um, what I'm going to be doing is in a few weeks' time, we're going to be doing a formal uh, release of the of, of what we did. Um, and um, But the thing is, what we didn't want to do, um, and the reason why I'm talking about wisdom, what I didn't want to do, Phil, I, uh, I didn't want to turn up on site with it with a TV camera um, going live on the BBC or something because we were doing it so unconventionally. Somebody would say that's not health and safety. Um, and in fact, ABP, um, after we'd moved the building, sent me an email saying, oh, we've got to put a stop on the movement because we haven't had your health and safety certificate information through. And I wrote to ABP and said, it's too late. We've already got the building. <laughs> OK. So uh, right. So what what I want us to do, what I want us to look at is I, I wanted us to. Um, Goff, you you, um, you did you did yesterday evening last last Thursday evening with me, didn't you? Not not last night. No, the night before. The week before. No, last week. Last week. Yes. Right. So so one of one of just a bit of a, a recap, Bill. Which um, you you didn't join us last Thursday, did you, Bill? No, you no, didn't. I, I, I was away. I was away up in um, where was I? Liverpool. Liverpool ah, last yeah. week. Yeah. Fair yeah. Uh, well, what, a few of the things that we spoke about last week uh, was uh, was a young female burial being found, um, and we talk about we 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 discussed about new finds being found in Portugal, Italy, and Croatia. Right, and all all. All of these finds had one thing in common: that that what we did think about the Mesolithic um, is nothing to what we knew um, ten years ago. And in fact, whenever I'm teaching about the Mesolithic now, people are more and more fascinated, and people want to know more and more about the Mesolithic period. Um, so one one of the, one of the things one of the things I wanted to do this week was to, um, and, and, and I, I did make it clear that we, that we weren't going to be having a, a massively long class today. One thing, one thing I wanted to uh, look at this week uh, was two sites, uh, one in Ireland and one site that you'd be very familiar with. 
Now, the, the site in Ireland that I want to look at is known as the Hermitage site. Um, and I've got a, I've got a little, um, I've got a li little academic paper in front of me. Um, and it, it's got loads of little images and stuff in it. So I'm, I'm going to try and get that up on the screen. And the other site that we're going to look at um, is associated with Cheddar Man. Um, and obviously Cheddar Man, um, Cheddar Gorge. Um, which is a which is a set of human remains which we've already looked at, um, but we looked at the, the rest of the archaeology from a Paleolithic context, not a Mesolithic context, right? So I've got some really great images here, um, and and I think it's best that we start at the Hermitage site in Ireland, and we've got a little article that I, I will read out from this article. But I will want to show you little images within this article. And it's quite an interesting way I'm going to do this today. So we'll just share. And um, and and I, I would I would say, Bill, that um, that when I started when I started when I started teaching um, the uh, Thursday morning class, I started teaching it in West Wales. Um, and we did it from the goat shed, didn't we, Goff? Yeah. And and today I'm in I'm in beautiful New Key, right? So um, I, I'm I'm just I'm, I'm a New Key and uh, I'm in work. So um, so so the so the site that we're going to look at there there it is. It's um it, it's it's the Hermitage site. It, it's it's a fascinating site in Ireland. Um, and there it is. There's the star to give you an idea of what we're looking at. And what, what we're looking at is that the Mesolithic period from Ireland is full of evidence associated, this is from County Mayo in Ireland, evidence of fish bones, massively interesting there, Mesolithic stone tools. We're starting to look at reconstructions there. And look at that, a Mesolithic fish trap also being found in Ireland. So what we what we are what we are doing with Ireland is that there's just so so much um, in the way of archaeological discoveries being found from an array of sites in Ireland and also the Ads Axe burial. So we're talking about a burial, and there is the artifacts that artifact that we're going to look at now, a shale Ads or a shale axe. Now. The, the key thing with this artifact, and we'll just keep this artifact up on the screen. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess around you. We'll, we'll just, we'll just keep this this artifact up on the screen. Um, and this itself, Mesolithic burials at Hermitage. So as the story goes with this landscape in Ireland, um, Hermitage site, Castle Connell. Um, in County Limerick, what we are finding is that the archaeology in Ireland isn't 6,000 years old, it's not 7,000 years old, it's not eight. The archaeology in Ireland takes us back 10,000 years at least, probably back as far as 12,000 years ago, where people could actually get to Ireland using that land bridge. So in the headlines of this, the earliest recorded inhabitants of Ireland date to at least 10,000 years ago. Um, and again, this great debate whether Ireland was linked to mainland Britain via a land bridge or not. Um, I say it was linked to Britain via a land bridge, but it was only a narrow land bridge. Some people say that the land bridge between mainland Britain and Ireland was lost about 7,000 years ago. Others say it never existed. Others say the land bridge was lost 10,000 years ago. But the main thing is, without being too pedantic, people lived in Ireland. Get over it. They did. People lived in Ireland 10, 12,000 years ago or even older. One problem is that we do find in Ireland is the politics. The politics in Ireland is quite, is quite ugly because it's still very political. Um, there was... I, I was told that somebody was watching a TV program recently and there was a Northern Ireland archaeologist and a Southern Ireland archaeologist. The one was arguing, oh, 
we've got evidence to say that Northern Ireland was always different from the South. And somebody in the South saying, oh, the Southern Ireland was always different from the North. And therefore, we do justify that Northern Ireland should be separate from Southern Ireland, which is, in my book, without being um, assassinated by, by um, a Protestant, um, is absolute nonsense. Um, th there's no definition between North and Southern Ireland, but people like to think it is. And on that backdrop, um, come on, come on, Bill, just say it. Come on, get on with the point. The point is, is that, you know, it stopped academic debate in Ireland. It stopped people <coughs> wanting to see the diff wanted to see the differences over time, but there is no difference between North and South. In 2001, this site itself, um, this site itself, um, and, and there we go, there's, there's a, another little bit of an image of this wonderful artifact. This site in County Limerick was found in 2001. So you can imagine that our perspective, our interpretation of Ireland is still very, very new um, in how we understand what's going on in Ireland. When we look at Cheddar, Cheddar Man, for example, his remains were found at the beginning of 1900. So, you know, in Ireland, we, we, are, we are over 100 years behind in some places with academic research, which, which is quite a lot. And, um, you know, somebody was reading something earlier on and, and I was reading, I, I, I've been reading um, about this difference between people accepting previous cultures, particularly in the United States. Um, and it, it, it is quite shocking that we're, that we're still having to rewrite history to where it should be. And this site itself at Hermitage is near the River Shannon. Well, the site itself back in the day would be far away from, from the sea, but it, would have, it is naturally near the River Shannon today. Um, and it revealed that this area had been used in places over a long period of time, which is, which is where we need to think and where we need to see. Given a rare glimpse of how people used natural materials from the locality with using natural accessible links, using the River Shannon to maybe extend their reach. Now, the reason why I'm saying extend the reach is that one person said to me very recently, I think this was actually last week, or was it on Tuesday? I'm not sure. Uh, they said, um, Carl, why are archaeologists obsessed with trade? And I should have turned around and said, archaeologists are obsessed with ritual. Archaeologists are obsessed with answers. And when we don't see those answers and we don't understand it, we always put it down to trade and ritual. right? So what we're talking about, we're talking about this axe. And we're talking about, we're talking about, is it about trade or is it about people just collecting things and moving around and just sort of living? And that's the better way of looking at it. People are just living, moving around and being the people who they're meant to be. So when, again, when we do think about the Mesolithic period and we, when we do think about earlier periods, um, um, it is a surprise for Irish archaeologists to discover Mesolithic remains of very early dates. And also cremated rem remains of a very early date. Now, why do we say that? You know, what, what, what's he on about, right? Why can't people have cremated people in the past? They bloody didn't cremate them in the Mesolithic period, but they did. We're now getting evidence of people being cremated in the Mesolithic period. Hang on a minute, let's just stop. This is a good point. How did they manage to get the temperatures to create human remains? Huh? Surely in Ireland, they're burning peat and peat only burns at about 200, 250 degrees C and you're gonna hardly, you're gonna hardly char a set of human remains rather than uh, let alone cremate them. But these people would have had naturally occurring um, these would have had naturally occurring um, coal being washed up on the shore, which they could burn. In Ireland at this stage, there was wood, there was timber. You can get temperatures um, um, in, in far in the excess of, of, of three, four, 500 degrees C, maybe higher. They, 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 maybe if you're thinking about charcoal as well, maybe six, seven, 800 degrees C. 
So you could cremate human remains. And this is in the Mesolithic period when we're told that people in the Mesolithic period didn't understand Jack. So, um, and and what 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 we're thinking of again is is using the science to understand the archaeology. Obviously, blunting traces on the blade edge of this artifact, right? Is it an axe? Is it is it an adze? Is it for plowing? <clears throat> Carl, yeah, go for it. Can I ask a question? Please. How can that be shale? Because shale is an early form of slate, and slate is brittle. So as a tool, it'd be useless. So that well, doesn't look that, that doesn't look like a shale to me. What am I missing? It is. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is a form of shale. A blue john. You've heard a blue john up, there, up from Yorkshire. Yeah, well, that's not that's not shale, is it? Um, I don't think it is. They're, they're defined. They're defining it as a sedimentary stone. R rather than an igneous or a metamorphic stone, so this is this is what we're talking about. So ag again, you got a good point there, Bill. Right, you got a good point. Um, there, there are different stone consistencies um, that 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 could possibly be hard enough, but this could be a perfect tool for an adze. This is this is this is as an adze rather than an axe. So the point is, Bill, is these types of tools. Uh, would make it very difficult to cut things, but being used as a, you've answered your own question, Bill. It's going to be fairly soft, isn't it? So, so therefore, there we go at the top as an adze rather than an axe. You've answered your own question, Bill. Yeah. I, so I you are right. I would it's challenge be... that, that 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 is uh, n not shale, in my opinion. Carry on. Okay. No, I... Bill. Bill. We'll 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 see. We'll we'll see. Uh, up in this article, it said, yeah, you are right. It does look heftier. It look, does look more compacted. Um, but you do have Blue John, which which is a shale. So, you know, that's very hard. But anyway, crack on. You know, I, you, you, um, um, I, I invited that, Bill. So that's fine. So anyway, carrying on. This was actually found with the burials, Bill. Um, and it was it, it within an area of two cremations. Now, we don't associate cremations with the Mesolithic period, but now we do because that's when they're dated to, Bill. So in other words, we've got two bits of evidence that don't fit in with the Mesolithic narrative. But here is, that's the archaeology. Further discoveries um, include charcoal. Well, that answers it then, doesn't it? Um, a number of other stone tools, chert tools, and um, which again, uh, chert is is sedimentary as well, Bill. But as you know, chert's not very good. It's not very hard. So yeah, um, the site at Hermitage is located within sort of Mesolithic landscape location. But we do have burials. But when we think about this site, um, it's a ridge of high ground overlooking a river, um, which which would have had fishing possibilities, would have had movement possibilities, and all these other things. One thing that we've established in the Mesolithic period is that the, the habitation sites for people in the Mesolithic period can be here, there, and everywhere. We're now working out that lots of people did live in up, upland areas, as we're actually finding from Scottish examples. We're finding out that people in the Mesolithic period, some one or two people did live in caves. We, we do know that one or two people lived on, on the coast and so on. Um, so we're actually standing to understand that the Mesolithic period across Britain is massively um, is massively more complicated than we ever dreamed of. And do you know what, right? Um, I think I may have said this on Tuesday, but correct me if I may have said this on Thursday, right? Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, it was on Tuesday, right? Um, Bill, you know, you just mentioned about the axe and you challenged what it was made of. Great, right? Um, but I want to go a bit deeper. When, when, we, when we look at the Mesolithic period, we really, we really gleam and we really take as much detail out of it, don't we? We, 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 really, we really rip it to bits like Star Car. We really rip the footprints to bits like at Formby. We really look at Boulder Cliff and we look at the platforms down there, right? We really rip it to bits. We really gleam as much information out of it, right? Do we do the same with the Roman period, Bill? I don't know. The answer is no. no. 
and 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 you know what, Bill? The I I do get this a lot. I get people saying, "I'm not interested in the Roman period. It's too boring." I I, I prefer the Mesolithic period, and and I really I've actually understood why they're saying the Roman period is boring. Let me give you an example: Mesolithic Mesolithic uh, versus Roman period, right? Mesolithic period. You get an artifact like this and you tear it to bits. Mesolithic period. You get a set of human remains. You can find out what last meal they ate 10,000 years ago, right? Um, we're finding teeth, right? With the calculus buildup in the Mesolithic period from places in Portugal, Croatia, places um, um, in Italy, right? And, and we're, we're working out um, that they ate wild grasses, that they ate a certain type of fish and so on, right? When we look at human when we look at human remains, this is versus the Roman period. Uh, we see um, a set of human remains from the Roman period, and we basically say, "Oh, um, that's a set of human remains. They're buried in X, Y, and Z." We don't really analyze any further than that, right? We get a we get a half from the Mesolithic period. Um, we we work out that the hazelnut shells were from a certain tree down the road. We work out that the hazelnut shells give us a date. We work out that the hazelnut shells were found at a certain time of year. You look at a Roman site, you see a half, and you leave it there, right? Um, and and we think we know, we really think we know about the Roman period. We don't. We we take the Roman period at face value and we present it, right? And I think the reason why uh, the Roman period can be very tedious and boring at times is because we don't analyze it. And and that I will stick by that. And now, Bill, do you understand what I'm talking about? Will you would you agree on that? Would you disagree? Let's let, let, let's chat. You 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 come back at me, Bill. Do you agree or disagree with what I've just said? I think there's probably a great buzz if you find something new in the Mesolithic than the Roman, because we yeah. know quite a lot about the Romans, but there's so much unknown about them in the Mesolithic, isn't it? So if you find something new, yeah, that's really uh, that's really good. But Bill, Bill, I'm going to take it even further, right? I'm picking on you today, sorry. Um, um, I'm going to take it even further, right? There is so much being found about the Mesolithic period now. I'm not going to say we're going to be in the same position as the Roman period, right? But there's so much we're discovering about the Mesolithic period. And I only hope that we still keep doing the same analysis on the Mesolithic period as we're doing. Right. Because one day we'll be able to look at the Roman period and the, and the Mesolithic period on balance. And I do believe we will. We're not going to have the same number of Mesolithic sites out there, but we will have a lot of Mesolithic evidence. And I'm going to chuck that out there and I get, we're going we're to leave that there for a moment. Right. So. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to um, I'm going to go back there a little bit. And put another image up there, and we've we've got some nice flint artifacts there as well. So th this is this is from the same landscape, and we're getting dates, radiocarbon dates. You know, I I I, I want to get through this, but I I, I probably I probably we're going to be doing probably a little bit more than an hour today, as I said. But I want to crack on with this. So so this wonderful site that we're looking at, um, we we we've, we've got we, we're really starting to pull out as much information as we can um, and when we think about this hermitage side we, we, we can think sort of a little bit of a conclusion before we go into a little bit more detail here right because we are going to go in a little bit more detail the site of the hermitage is located as we say it, with access to the river Shannon um, we, we use the word hunter gatherer but we, we really need we, we haven't really found their settlement sites in Ireland. Is it going to be the same type of settlement evidence that we're seeing in mainland Britain? If so, the advances in the Mesolithic period are being made a lot, lot earlier. And, and why, why is that significant? Right. When we look in the, when we go into the Neolithic period, right, and we look at places like Newgrange, I've never been to Newgrange, but don't tell me, Bill, you have um, in Ireland, this, this beautiful Neolithic chamber in Ireland, right? You've got a long corridor, you've got carvings, beautiful, huge. And we look at Newgrange and we say, there it is. And what I'm saying is that to build to these mega burials 
in Ireland, you must have had a development. You must have had people thinking, this is what we do with burial in the Mesolithic, and this is what we're going to do, and blah, 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 blah. What I'm saying is that there is no such thing as a Stone Age, a Stonehenge answer, a Stonehenge answer. And what we mean by that, Bill, is you don't wake up on a Wednesday and suddenly build Stonehenge. There's got to be a development leading to it. You know, um, for example, somebody said to me the other day, they said, um, they, they said, how are you building a house and you're an archaeologist? And I said, well, um, a, a, a year ago, I wouldn't be able to build a house. I wasn't capable of building a house. But because I, I, I've been building structures and I've been making mistakes and things have been falling down and the roofs have been ripped off by the wind and I've been using this wood and it's the wrong wood and that wood and all the rest of it, right? I have learned how to build a house. But then again, I'm in my late 40s and my dad's a carpenter. So all the little bits I've picked up are over time. And I'm building this thing by myself. Don't ever tell me that Stonehenge is built overnight, right? Because people's skills to develop Stonehenge must have been built over thousands of years in their mindsets, right? And when we think about somewhere like, I'm getting, I'm getting defensive for a reason because I'm getting really upset with the fact that we seem to start in history and there's nothing else before. It's almost as if we wake up on a Wednesday and it's the Roman period. It's absolute bull, bull's ends, right? It doesn't happen like that. So looking at the Mesolithic period in Ireland helps us understand the Neolithic period and the Neolithic period helps us understand the Bronze Age and so on and so on and so on. I avoid doing Ireland because of, of, of the damage that we see being of occurring in history that we're not really being given the evidence, right? So anyway, let's crack on. Let, let's, let's sort of say a little bit more. Let, let, let's sort of go, go on a little bit more. So... Um, these, these people that you can refer to as hunter-gatherer are people that were interacting and using wood and stone, interacting with our landscape. Excavation did not yield evidence um, of the full extent of what we see within this site at Hermitage. But we do have the burials. We do have the artifacts. And all of this, all of this links to um, a landscape which is rich in food, transport, fishing, water, people's um, interrelations, people's intercourse, um, and sites as well, archaeology, everything. Most unexpectedly, again, they're talking about the cremations, the, the exciting cremations. We've never, in all my Mesolithic stuff, we've not mentioned a single Mesolithic cremation. But in, in Ireland, we've got two. Uh, yeah. We're now getting lots of burials in the Mesolithic. Mm, we're finding where they buried and put their people. And by the way, they didn't just put them in caves either. They didn't. So this is one of the things, this, this is one of the things we say, all right, you know, what we're going to do. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to, um, uh, you know, we, we, we're just going to have sort of, go out there and um, everything straightforward but it's not so what we've got is we've got a landscape that these people have a specific knowledge sophistication to be able to burn human remains to be honest with you right i'm going to say it as it is um you know i i i've said i've said to my family right if anything happens to me get me declared as dead take my body to where we are in west wales and burn me right um, which, which um, the legal grounds is, as long as the body's been declared um, dead um, and you've got a, certi a certificate, the body, the family may dispose of the body in, in the way fit, depending on how you interpret the law. However, it's not as simple as that. You've got to have the right wood to burn my body, right? You've got to have the right um, circumstances to burn my body. You've got to know how the body burns and then you've got to be able to dispose of what's left. These people knew. These people, and this is a modern society. My family are not going to be able to burn my body because they're not going to have the knowledge or ability to do it. But they were able to burn human remains. Look at those dates there. Look at those dates nearly 10,000 years ago. This is, we, we take technology in the past for granted. 
we think it's easy for them to do things. It's bloody not because we can't do it ourselves today. I pick Bill, I'm picking on you again, right? Do you know the legs of that building that we, we moved? <coughs> the length, the height, you mean? The, the legs, the legs of the building. Yeah. Uh, you know they yeah. you know you know they actually use stainless steel. Really? Um, and you know what? The reason why we struggle to cut through the legs is because the stainless steel was so pure that it that, that, that it wasn't blemished or anything when we cut through it. Right. There was I, I'm actually trying to find because oh Bill, I, I I'm gonna I, I don't know, right? We're, we're, we're gonna, I, I want to make a point. I wanna make a point. This is really relevant. We're, we're, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you an example of what I've got in my hand a minute. We gotta do this. Right, Bill? This is actually what we cut through. No, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that stainless steel, Carl, because stainless steel basically doesn't rust. It, there's no rust on it at all. What's what's that on the outside? Oh, that's the way it's been cut. Not the outside, I mean, the circumference. It's, it's a coating. Oh, I see. Yeah. I was just surprised because obviously it's, it's much more expensive to fabricate something in stainless steel than carbon steel. But there we are. Uh, yeah, Bill, the point is, the point is, is we think that that building was a lot more important than we think. Mm, yeah. Um, th th this is what he was cutting through. Okay. And yeah. wh when he cut, when he cut through it, right? The reason, the reason why some of the some of the stuff looked, some of the stuff on the structure looked like it rusted, right? Was because it we were looking at the wrong bars. Yeah. The, there was there was eight of these rods running through the four all four legs. Mm. And the point is, is that. They built things back then far better than they build them today. Mm, yeah. Well, go the, along with that. They go along with that, yeah. And the point is, Bill, right, is that we do not interpret the past and give people credit where it's due in the past. We don't. Absolutely not. No. What annoys me is when you get um, these, these books being produced, particularly by American authors, who claim that the pyramids were actually built by aliens who came in from space. They annoy me because they disrespect the, uh, the, the, the past and their ancestors totally, you know. They're and so, they also, naive. so naive, some of them. And they also disrespect the fact that I think you are right. I think there's technology that we don't rightly understand with the pyramids. There's no way could they do them with bloody um, uh, stone axes. They can't, yeah. you know, I, I'm sorry, to, to try and cut through some of that stone with stone mm. axes. Mm. And we, we mm. haven't found all the... we don't. If you're going to cut those stones with stone axes, right, you'd probably need hundreds to cut one block. If, mm. if that's the case, right, there would be billions of these stone axes in a huge pile somewhere. Have we found these stone axes? Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, crack on. Do you know what? We're probably only going to do the hermitage, site right, because I'm going off in a right tangent. Um, but that's what I do. <laughs> so anyway, crack on. And... Uh, I know, I, I, um, but we, but obviously tonight's recording will will actually be online. So, um, so uh, not tonight. Yeah, there is tonight's recording. So um, there we go. I tell you what, right? Look at that. The cremated remains. Look at that. Now that there is the level of cremated remains that you would see with a modern cremation. Um, and with a modern cremation, we use, we, we actually use gas. We burn human remains with gas. We don't use wood. We use gas. Um, just, just, just as, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something tender, right? It's not disrespectful. Even when they were burning um, the bodies that the SS had to dig up at the extermination camps in Poland and Germany, because the Allies were advancing, right? They, they, they couldn't, they couldn't burn the bodies to the degree that they could destroy the evidence in the gas chambers, right? And that's burning bodies in gas chambers that had already decayed, right? Um, so these people in the past 
and with great respect to all those people who were placed into the gas chambers, these people had a higher degree of understanding about disposing of human remains than lots of people in the extermination camps. I've said it. Cremation A in particular illustrates that sophistication and ritual, but forget the sophistication, the word knowledge, the knowledge, the ability to burn human remains. This, and the other thing as well is it says in my notes that this evidence is gonna be very rare. Well, of course it's gonna be very rare folks because they're cremated, duh. And, and you're thinking, well, you know, we haven't been looking properly. We, you know, cremated bone, cremated bone actually starts to decay more rapidly than non-cremated remains because um, the, the, the carbon's reacting with the non-burnt bones and all the rest of it, and, and that has an effect. Um, the, so what, what, we, what we need to look at, all right, is just that little statement. And, and there, you, there you go, these pits. Um, there we go. That, that's, that, that's where the cremated remains were in, a little pit in the ground. Um, and it's saying, there we go, the cremated remains in green, right? And there was a post in there. So that was a little bit of a marker, right? That, that, that was a little bit of a marker. So this is what we're actually talking about. But if we go back to the, if we go back to the sort of ax again, right, there we go, go back to the ax. Or, or we're, we're referring to it as an ads, right? They're saying that this, 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 this polished ax suggest that the burial person was important and of high status. Um, and the post hole that we've already seen represents a grave marker. So they had grave markers. So the burial might be remembered and, and returned to. The Mesolithic finds that her hermitage are internationally significant, being amongst the earliest cremated burials anywhere in the, in, anywhere in the world. And I think that that's, that's amazing to actually say that. And, and to be honest with you, Bill, it, it's talking about this is um, Bill. Bill, I, you know what? I, I, I am th this academic piece, Bill. Right there, it is. It says it there, Bill. A, a large polished adze, axe made of shale, Bill. And do you know what, Bill? This this looks like something from the Penman Maya Axe Factory or something similar. Obviously, it's not. Um, and, mm. But I, I I think I think Bill, I think you've got a good point there. It is really it is really difficult to analyze the components of this. But Bill, you've seen it in black and white. I'm not going to argue with you. You've got your ideas, and we're going to leave it there. Yeah. So oh. you, you might. You know, sometimes, Bill, archaeologists get things wrong. I'm just going with this academic article. That's all. You know, I like challenging things. So um, it, it's, um, this axe is, is 20 centimetres, so it's quite a big one. Um, and they're thinking it might be an adze because of the reasons that we've discussed. discussed. An adze is a similar tool to an axe. Both are used... Um, and the ads itself, you could interpret it as, as a plowing tool, or you could actually interpret it as a tool, as an axe or an ads to typically um, chop or cut through wood. If it is an ads in the context of a plowing object, right, to plow a field or both, this would be an example of an earliest form of agriculture, some of the earliest agriculture anywhere, anywhere in the world, and it happens to be an island. In both examples, if it's a plow tool or an axe, at the rear end there, that's where that would be hafted and actually used as a tool um, in whatever way you wish it to be used. From its form, we know that this object functioned as an active tool. It is not possible to identify the exact source of the shale used to make the ads, although the shale outcrop might be either in Limerick or um, Southwest Clare or basically anywhere in the south of Ireland. The shale could have been sourced locally or perhaps another part of Ireland, but probably not outside Ireland, but we never know. During the Mesolithic period, people were collecting and possibly even trading, obviously that's the old sort of thing if it was trading, 
um, with various different objects across the landscape. Um, reproducing the ads by combining technological analysis and a program of experimental research. Researchers concluded that the ads probably took about six hours to make. Well, if it took six hours to make, it must be a very soft scale. Answering your point, Bill. If, if yeah. there, you, you, I've got to be honest with you, right? You're not going to be able to create an axe that comes from Penman Meyer or the Cumbrian Fells, right, in six hours. You're not going to be able to do it because it was too hard to do it in six hours. Um, so if they're using shale for shale, this is unlikely to be used as a cutting tool to cut down a tree. Totally unlikely. Um, it said this included 15 um, for roughing the edge, 15 minutes every, so it would take 15 minutes to rough the edge. Grinding it on a sizable block of red sandstone. Um, they, they, they're saying, right, hang on a minute. So it goes to say that you need red sandstone to actually grind the edges of this, right? So red sandstone is not really going to work on something like Pen Men Meyer, um, very old stone, right? So this is as soft as it looks. It, it, it's not as soft as, right, Bill, sorry, it is soft. It's a soft shale. So therefore, I'm going to discount it as being used to cut down anything like a tree. Um, it said that it said that it was then um, the surface was then um, polished with sandstone or leather and water, ash and animal fat as a lubricant. Curiously, whoever made the ads appears to have hurried the final stages of its manufacture be because despite taking care to grind and polish most of the surface to a very high finish, making sure to remove all signs of flaking, some flake scars can still be seen along one edge. Even though it is not completely polished, this ad represents one of the earliest known examples of a polished stone ad anywhere in, in the world. So we're getting lots of, we're getting lots of sort of um, evidence here. So here we go. There's another little bit more about this ads as, ads as well. When we look at microscopic analysis, I was, said I was going to do this. Although we have no direct evidence for um, to say that it had been hafted um, as, as sort of a normal axe might be hafted uh, with a shaft, in other words, um, indirect evidence from microscopic analysis of the ad surface using a technique called microware analysis showed that the ads was probably hafted with wood and plant bindings. Specialists were also able to identify traces, um, different types of polish edge roughing and flaking on the ads's surface that had resulted from it being used to chop. Did they say that it was used for chop wood? Although only for a short duration of time. So they're saying that this was only practical for cutting cutting into wood for a very short period of time, which was the point that we made. Considering the time and effort, so what we're going to do, we're going to go to that image there. Considering the time and effort spent making such a well-crafted object more than what would have been required for it to function effectively as an, as an axe or an adze, the short duration of its use is intriguing. It is possible that the adze was made for a burial rite because it was found with a cremation, perhaps used to cut the tree that was used as a grave marker, maybe, or even to dig the hole. Perhaps the most in intriguing thing that the micro wear specialist noticed when looking down the microscope was that the blade had been intentionally blunted. Voila. The sharp edge had, after being used to chop wood, been ground in such a way uh, as to create a blunt edge, making it no longer functionable as a wood chopping tool, unless it was resharpened again. 
what have we learned? So he's talking about what have we learned. So here we go. Blunting of stone adzes or axes in burials is known from other periods across Europe, but not Ireland. Um, it's said that this act may have been as a gesture. Researchers have suggested that the death of the ads, so they're, they're killing the ads, the person's dead, so they're killing it, they're blunting it, they're killing the ads uh, through blunting, may have also represented the death of the individual ac accompanied into the ground. Maybe it was belonged to the person it was buried with, so they decided to deliberately blunt it. The person's dead, the axe is dead. Long live the king. People tend to think of Mesolithic hunter-gatherers as lacking complex burial systems, but in this in this example, we do have it. Used in different scientific techniques to identify the specialist use, as, under, as made us understand that things in this time in Ireland were far more complicated than we could ever believe. We now know that the Hermitage ads played a key role in what appears to have been a coordinated funeral rite involving social and, and temporal complexity. Haste is evidence in the flake scarring. This begs the question, was there urgency to get this grave good into the ground? So they, they wanted to blunt this. They were needed to get out of the way. What's going on? It is unlikely that the ads was the personal property of the deceased. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. In spite of the time and effort given to its making, it was used for a short time to chop wood. This may have been the wood for the grave marker. Once blunted, the ad was placed carefully into the pit so that it rested again and again forever. They're saying it, it rested against the wood that it had actually been used to cut down. The blade or cutting edge of the adze was facing down into the pit and therefore also facing into the earth. Additionally, two flint microliths were found in this burial pit. So combined, this individual had a total of three grave offerings, or at least there are the artifacts that have survived. There may have been other offerings, but we, we haven't found them. So one, one thing, one thing that, we, that, that I wanted to do, right? One thing I wanted to do was to go into a lot more detail um, into this set of human remains. But, but what we are going to do, we're going to do a little bit more. And one of us has to get to back to his, um, get back to his other job. So I'm um, dressing up as a pirate, entertaining people. So what we're going to do here, we're going to, we're going to look. We're going to put that up there and we're going to look at a little bit of strontium. So here we go. Um, obviously, they're using strontium analysis to work out what's happening in Ireland with the bones. So a little bit more of a review about strontium. Right? That's the geology of Ireland. All the different colours down there. Um, if I can get into this. Right. Oh, 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 hang on a minute. Oh, hang on a minute. Down there. That, where that little black, black thing is on the left, that's where that's the site we're looking at. Um, strontium, as we've already established in the past, is a chemical <coughs> element, and its isotopes um, provide a fingerprint of different rock types. These have been well mapped throughout the world, and we have a good idea of what values to expect for areas with different uh, bedrocks. So in other words, there's strontium in our bone, and there's strontium in our teeth. So if we can trace the strontium that's in our bones and our teeth to the strontium in the rock, you can understand what water we were drinking, which then goes into our bone structure. And in other words, where we lived most of our lives. These have, um, so for example, places that have a limestone geology should have a different strontium signature to those places that have a sandstone geology. We can also analyze the strontium in human remains recovered from a, a whole variety of archaeological excavations. And we can also work out where animals came from because they have strontium as well, because animals drink water. What can strontium tell us? Science, scientific analysis of strontium are the potential to reveal where people were from, animals were from, where they grew up and lived all their lives, and how an in individual may have moved or migrated at different stages, looking at strontium. Um, 
with the values, obviously your teeth have got different uh, levels of buildup and, and your, your bones absorb strontium at different levels as they grow, as they grow. Um, and the best person, oh, I tell you what, this would be great. If you, if you get a burial and the person throughout their lives has had different breakages on their bones, um, you'd be able to work out precisely at which parts of Ireland that the person had those breakages. Um, because every time you break a bone, new bone growth uh, builds up and you've got different values of strontium in the bone. Job done, brilliant. Um, so this is a great, this is a great tool for, for our archaeology. How it works, strontium from the soil enters the food chain by being eaten by being taken up by plants, which are then eaten by, by animals, including humans, or we drink the water. It then enters our bones and teeth, um, substitute, um, um, substituting for calcium. It either harms, it, it, start again, it neither harms nor benefits us, but it's, it's alongside our calcium in our bones. The local strontium isotope signature of a particular area can be measured from modern plant samples. This baseline can then be compared to the results from archaeological samples of humans excavated in that area. All of strontium has a value. So here we go. Let's let's get the little um, image up there. Um, and there we go. There it is. How strontium enters the biosphere. Um, um, so atmosphere deposited... Um, um, in, in rain or dust. Strontium substitutes for calcium in bones and teeth alongside it. Um, and there you go. It goes into the soil, goes into the trees. You drink it, goes into the animals, uptake of water. So this is how we, we get the strontium in our bones. If the strontium isotope values are significantly different, it can be concluded that the individual is not originally from that area, but was buried there. So in other words, um, the best way of working this out is if you've got... Um, Animal bones being buried with a human being. The animals are probably local. Um, the human bones have a completely different strontium value. They come in from somewhere else, job done. They've moved around. It's great, isn't it? So in other words, Goff, you're not going to get away with all the places that you lived in because you're going to have strontium values. In this case, their strontium region can be compared to other regions and it can be estimated where the ind individual may have originated. One problem is strontium with, with modern analysis of human remains is that we go everywhere, don't we? If, so if we lived in Australia for the first 20 years of our lives and then we moved to Canada and we lived there for 10 bloody years and then we moved over to Britain, you need to have all the strontium values. Oh, I'm confused and that's not going to be for future generations. But in the past, people didn't move over massive differences or distances. Archaeological samples, in order to study strontium human remains from archaeological excavations like this one, like at the Hermitage, Human remains dated to the Meso Mesolithic period are very rare in Ireland, but now we're finding them. Strontium and its isotopes collected in the human body in tooth and, an and an animal and in, in bones. And these are formed at different stages of a person's life, usually when bone is being built up or teeth is being created. So hence why it's great to have a set of human remains where the person's been bashed around a bit because you're always going to get um, bone growth. Well, after a certain while, our, our bones stop growing, after the teeth stop growing. So this is a really important point. Tooth and enamel forms from infancy through early adolescence and does not change as a person ages. So the strontium isotope ratio of enamel matches the geology in the areas where a person spent his or her childhood. By contrast, the, the strontium in bones gradually changes over time. So obviously you, you're having different buildup in our bones. So this is really important as well. So it refers to the region where the person spent the, the, the various stages of their lives. So in your later lives, obviously, um, not just breakages on bones. In later life, life you, you might get other changes in our bones, particularly with women where strontium is going to be required at the menopause and so on and so on. There's going to be changes in the strontium levels wherever the person is actually from. Most studies prefer to analyze tooth enamel, since this is more resistant to contamination. Bone is normally not a good material for analysis unless um, it's, it's sort of in a burial context and it hasn't been contaminated. So sometimes when you're looking at strontium associated with um, cremated remains, it's not health, healthy because there's gonna be lots of contaminants, but you are gonna get, um, you are gonna get strontium in regards to uh, 
um, human uh, remains which have been cremated. So finally, what we're going to do, we're going to, um, I, I'm going to have to call it day in a few moments, but this is the last thing we're going to look at. So that's a, uh, a tree growing at Hermitage contains a local strontium isotope signature. You can actually get strontium, obviously, from the trees, from from um, from tree rings. It's great. Yeah, we're getting so much dating stuff now. It's just unbelievable. So initial result, results from the strontium for our site at um, Hermitage, County Limerick. Initial results from Hermitage human remains is that the individual uh, buried um, in Pit A likely spent a, at least the last decade of their life in the local area, as the strontium values are similar to that of plants growing here. However, the results from Pit B, which has got the other cremated remains, uh, are not consistent with the local region, suggesting that this individual either moved to Hermitage um, sometime prior to their death, or perhaps their cremated remains were brought there specifically for burial. In other words, what we're learning now about, about our ancestors, the Mesolithic period, any, any, any period, is so opening that, um, you know, Mesolithic period is massively fascinating. On that note, sorry we've got to... Um, sorry, I've got to dash. I did say this is going to be an hour. We just, we've gone over an hour, which is fine. Um, so we're going to stop that now. Um, you, Bill. I was just interested in the, um, the, the odds which uh, the edge had been planted deliberately. When, yeah. um, with the cremated remains, indicating yeah. that obviously it, it could no longer be used by the uh, deceased, etc. I'm yes, just thinking, yes. it, it's, it's the opposite. It's the opposite attitude in the tombs of Cairo, isn't it? Because all the um, weapons there buried with the pharaohs, etc., were kept intact because it was felt that the deceased had to use them in the afterlife. So there's no need to sort of uh, damage them. They had to be kept in pristine condition for his use, you know. So the attitudes, and we're talking about roughly the same periods, aren't we? Different well, periods um... in the south and... Well, um, obviously, obviously, ancient Egypt, you're talking about sort of the, the Scorpion King. Um, you're talking going back to, was it 6,000? 4,000, 5,000, aren't you? 5,000 years, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, yeah but, but obviously with the Mesolithic period going back to 10. But, but obviously, um, you can make comparisons with burial. The one thing I would say is maybe if it was used for an ad, right, it's, it's banging, it, you know, as a plow instrument, it's going to be blunting itself, uh, being dragged through the ground. Well, yes, then this is why I contend that it's not it's not shale. But there we are. That's what it says in black and white. So who am I to argue without uh, but the thing the thing is, Bill, evidence. the thing is if it if it only if it if they made a reconstruction out of similar material and it only took six hours to create that object, it's gotta be shale. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. Oh Bill, wait, wait, let's not get let's not get pretend. Oh, okay then, all right, then that's it. Thank you, Carl. The main thing is the main thing is the object, isn't it? That there is being yeah. found. So I think yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. Thank you for that, Bill. Okay. Um, Goff, is there anything you'd like to say, darling? Oh, it's very good. But just one observation I wanted to make was: uh, Please do. You, you, you have these adzes and and um, and axes that we find from the Mesolithic period, and I know that they still use adz in boat building now. It's still being used as a tool, exactly mm. the same method. So uh, that's amazing, isn't it? And what I, what I, what a tool those th both those things are, how they last through time. They don't change. And the concept and the idea, exactly. And, um, and you know, yeah, I, I got to say so, something quite sort of, um, you know, our, our, our aspirations as human beings are to live peacefully, um, are to live a life, to have the resources to bring up a family and to live comfortably. And these were the aspirations in the past we have all we have all lost that. We we are obsessed with looking at the Second World War and 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 we're looking at warfare and defenses and the Roman army and the Battle of Hastings and all these things. But these people had more gentler lives, more understandable lives, not straightforward, not simple, but lives that push them through life, which is what, the way we should be looking at these people. Nothing more nothing less so um what i'm gonna say is um oh yes yes 
I nearly forgot to mention it. Bill. Bill what? I nearly, forgot, I nearly forgot to mention it, Bill. I've got to remind you all that the next money's for the next two months are due. Oh, no. It is, yes. It's, 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 now, it's now the 2nd of September. We, we've got, you've got until the end of next week to pay me, guys. Come on. So we're talking about two hours on Thursday nights now, Carl, are we? Well, what we're, what we're going to do, Bill, what, 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 what is happening, right? We've got the 6 o'clock till 7, right? And then we've got the, 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 um, the 7 till whenever, right? So if you want to dip out early, Bill, because you want to go to bed at 8, but it will certainly be going on a lot longer than half past eight. So in other words, because you're doing the session at um, between six and seven, right? There's that session. And then the late, then the, the actual proper class between seven and whatever. Okay. All right. Let's Carl, see it goes. Yeah, I've got a question about it. I mean, I'm going away, you know, in two weeks time for three weeks to Medea and I won't be able to watch, uh, I won't pretend the, <clears throat> the evening sessions in Madeira. So uh, have you got any sessions in the mornings that I could attend? Well, well, well Goff, Goff, if you, um, Goff, what I'm going to, what I'm going to do, right, I, I might sort of, I'm, I might gently, I, I, I might gently turn around and say, well, are you, you, you're about next week, yeah? Yeah. Right. What I might gently do is just, um, I, I might turn around and say, well, you know, do you want to join us for a, a little bit on a Friday morning? It'd probably be nine o'clock, though. Well, that doesn't matter. It's better for me when I'm away on selling myself by the pool, you know. So uh, it's a bit selfish, I know, but I don't want to I don't want to pay for three sessions. I'm not going to attend. You know, that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, what, 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 what I could do, what I could do is we could have something nice and gentle in the morning on a Friday for, for an hour or whatever. And it, like, well, today's not being nice and gentle because it was like a last minute thing. But if we had a little bit more of a plan, then we then it would be. Yeah, well, that's it, great. I mean, um, it would be, uh, yeah, so. When we went away, I attended, the, I attended the Thursday morning and it worked perfectly for us. Uh, I managed to see that all the lectures, you know, and now. Uh, yeah, so that'll be, I'll leave it with you anyway. Well, we'll have a chat about it next week. I thought I'd mention the right. money now because it, we'll mention it next week and say, I need the bloody money now. And you should have mentioned it last week. So, yeah. Euros, so I mean, pounds. Uh, it's 50 pounds. Yeah, that's the one. Not 50 euros. Hang on a minute. If it's, do we get more if it's 50 euros? No. Uh, <laughs> hang on. I, I, I th hang, hang on. I thought the pound was doing really badly against the euro. But it is. So what does that mean? It's still, one, it's still 110. No, it's still 50 pounds is more than 50 euros, shall we say? Full stop. Yes. It's 118, it is. For the oh, I don't, I don't understand this bloody stuff. Neither do I. I don't. But, okay, 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 right. Okay. Well, well, how much? How much? If you gave me 50 quid, right? If no, if you gave me 50 euros, how many? How many? How many? How many? How many well, what would that be in pounds? Quid. Well, 45 quid, but I'm only joking, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I bloody hope you are. <laughs> okay, let, let, go back know. to farming, Carl. Go back to farming. Okay. i got to go as well. Bye-bye. Okay, okay bye. you two. Take care, bye. Bill and Goff. Take care. Thanks, bye. Then. Next bye. Th Thursday bye, next then. week. Thursday bye. next week. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Anyway, thanks for watching that. I'm going to call it a day. I've got to crack on. I've got to crack on with work. Thank you very much.